साधु मीन्स गुड भाज लैंग्वेज सो बिफोर वी डू समथिंग गुड एंड आफ्टर वी डू समथिंग गुड वी विल से साधु मीन्स गुड 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 so before we talk about the other meditations i was just thinking let's see how to build the foundation to develop this meditation now you know we it's hard to practice meditation without having the foundation so there's a nice teaching of the buddha so in this teaching he shows us what what we should need in order to have this foundation to practice meditation so once you have this foundation it will be really easy to practice meditation so the name of this teaching is megya so megya was a monk he was buddha's attendant so once venerable megya was the buddha was the buddha's attendant then venerable megya approached the blessed one paid homage to him stood to one side and said to him bante I would like to enter Jantugama for arms, for arms round. So he wanted to go to a village called Jantugama. Buddha said, "You may do so, Megya, at your own convenience." Then in the morning, the venerable Megya dressed, took his bowl and robe, and entered Jantugama for arms. When he had walked for arms in Jantugama, after his meal. on returning from his arms round he went to the bank of the kimikala river so there was a river so he went to that bank of the river as he was walking and wandering around for exercise along the bank of the kimikala river the venerable megya saw a lovely and delightful mango grove so there was a small forest with mango trees so it occurred to him this mango grove is truly lovely and delightful suitable for striving for the striving of a cleansman intent of striving if the blessed one permits me i will come back to this mango grove to strive so he saw a nice place a quiet place now he wanted to go there and meditate so he also like to do that right so he said okay if the blessed one gives me if buddha gives me the approval i will go there and i will meditate so he came to the buddha and told what he saw this nice mango grove and he uh, now he wants to go there but buddha knew that he doesn't have this now you know we ha- our mind have to mature to practice this meditation to get good results out of meditation so buddha knew that this may this monk may he didn't have a matured mind to meditate in a lonely place now to go and meditate in a lonely place you have to have a matured mind without having the background it will be really hard to meditate like that so he said so he wanted to go there so he said if the blessed one permits me i will go back to the mango grove to strive so buddha said as we are alone may gear wait until another bhikkhu comes along he said now as we are alone just wait until another monk comes then after that you can go but he said that because he knew that this megya didn't have a matured mind to meditate to go to a place like that and meditate a second time the venerable megya said to the blessed one bante for the blessed one there is nothing further to be done and no need to increase what has been done but bante i have something further to be done and need to increase what has been done so if the blessed one would permit me i will go back to that mango grove to strive so he for the second time also he asked from the buddha that he said that he want to go to meditate to that place the second time also buddha said as we are alone may gear wait until another bhikkhu comes 
along for the th third time the venerable mage said to the blessed one bante for the blessed one there is nothing further to be done and no need to increase what has been done but bante i have something further to be done and need to increase what has been done if the blessed one would permit me i will go back to that mango grove to strive now for the third time also he asks now the nature of a buddha is if someone asks for three times he will give the approval so buddha said since you speak of striving megya what can i say to you you may go to go at your own convenience so he gave the permission to go there and meditate so then the venerable megya rose from his seat paid homage to the buddha and he went to that mango grove he entered and sat down at the foot of a tree to pass the day then while the venerable megya was dwelling in the mango grove three kinds of bad unwholesome thoughts frequently occurred to him sensual thoughts thoughts of ill will and thoughts of harming now he wanted to go and meditate there but what happened unwholesome thoughts arise in him thoughts of sensual thoughts thoughts of ill will and thoughts of harming now have you noticed that when you try to meditate sometimes thoughts come to your mind now in normal day to day life you, those thoughts will not come to your mind normally when you do something suppose you are working sometimes these kind of thoughts will not arise in your mind but when you try to meditate there will be thoughts that you you would never think that those thoughts will arise in your mind does it make sense so those kind of unwholesome thoughts he now arose in him then he was thinking this is truly amazing i have gone forth out of faith from the household life into the homelessness yet i am still stalked by these three kind of bad unwholesome thoughts so now he couldn't meditate because there are unwholesome thoughts in the mind now so then the venerable megya approached again now he came back now he can't meditate <laughs> he came back then the venerable megya approached the blessed one paid homage to him sat down to one side and said here bante while i was dwelling in the mango grove three kinds of bad unwholesome thoughts frequently occurred to me thoughts of sensual thoughts thoughts of ill will and thoughts of harming it then occurred to me this is truly amazing i have gone forth out of faith from the household life into the homelessness yet i'm still stalked by these three kinds of bad unwholesome thoughts so then buddha said megya when the liberation of the mind has not been matured five things leads to its maturation what five so he says if our mind is not matured enough to meditate you have to have this five kind of things he says we are lacking of these five things first one he says the first thing that we have to have if we want to get good results out of practice in buddhism first thing he says you have to have good friends that's the first thing now the question is who's a good friend what do you think Hmm? So tell me who's a good friend. Someone who will listen to you, someone who can talk to you, someone who can be friendly to you without judgment. Okay. Okay. Practicing what? Meditation. Meditation. Okay, okay. Someone who inspires 
that's right yes means now someone who will help you to develop wholesome qualities in you and someone who will help you to remove unwholesome qualities that you have suppose now for example suppose someone says something bad now you're angry with this person so you will go to a friend and say this person told me this so if this friend says you have to say something in return do this in return now what if, what will happen to your defilement it will grow in you right but remember now <laughs> don't try to reject everyone now but it won't happen like that you can't do like that just you have to keep in mind this thing and don't try to judge and right reject people don't try to do that so if so if you go to a person and if you say okay i have anger in me this person did this if that person helps you to remove the anger that you have he says that is a good person means that person will help you to develop wholesome qualities in you so that is the first thing that you have to have if you want to get good results out of meditation having good you have to surround yourself with good friends mm, does it make sense <laughs> and the thing what you have to keep in mind is that now the what you call the can i say the environment i don't know what you call this the environment that we have will not help us to develop good qualities in us if you go outside what will happen all the time defilements will arise in you right if you are not mindful it most of the time those things will help you to develop defilements in you not to remove the defilements to get attached to things there are things that you will get angry with jealousy you will get jealousy so if you are not mindful if you go to this world you will have a lot of defilements and having those defilements if you go to a friend and say something if that friend is helping you to remove that defilement from you that's a good friend so we have to surround ourselves with good friends so that's the first thing that you should have then he says again a bhikkhu is virtuous virtuous means you have to have good bodily actions verbal actions and mental actions especially bodily here he is talking about bodily and verbal actions so now normally you know buddhist they observe precepts right for lay people they say to take five precepts abstaining from killing stealing adultery yeah sexual misconduct uh, lying lying and, and drugs yes taking intoxicating drinks and drugs for he says to observe these five precepts why is that Now, suppose there's a person who is always lying or stealing or misconducting hmm? killing so what kind of mind state would that person have a defiled mind right yes. he is making other people angry also and he is also cultivating anger so if you have that mind state he says you won't be able to meditate right now now when you observe now you know normally there are three kinds of actions right bodily actions verbal actions and mental actions so now when you take precepts what kind of ac- actions are you guarding is it bodily actions verbal actions mental actions or all three hmm Any other answers? All three. What do you think? Mm-hmm. What are mental actions? Mm-hmm. 
Now you sense, we can see this. If we know what are the bad bodily actions, verbal actions and mental actions. Yeah. If you know those things, we know that when you take the precepts, what kind of actions that we are avoiding. Right now, what are bad bodily actions he says that we should not do? Hmm? You shouldn't do bad verbal actions. No, I'm saying bodily actions, bodily yeah. things, not verbal. <coughs> Mainly he says? Sexual misconduct. Okay, sexual misconduct. What else? Killing. Killing. Killing, Killing who? Killing animals. animals. Killing living beings. Killing living beings. Mm-hmm. So when you say living beings, ant is also a living being. So, small creatures are also living beings. So, abstaining from killing living beings, sexual misconduct, and what's the other main one? Stealing. And what is normally what it means is you have to avoid any behavior that will that could cause harm in others and yourself. Verbal actions. What are the verbal actions that you should avoid? Lying, Gossip. gossiping, mm. okay, divisive speech. That's another one. Hmm? Huh? Curse means harsh words. Harsh words, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> harsh words yes. Lying, gossiping, divisive words and harsh words. So divisive words, gossiping, it's not the same, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Divisive means to d- divide people, the words that you say to divide. Like suppose there are friends, you want to divide them. You will say something bad about this friend to the other friend and something bad about this friend to the other friend to divide them. So divisive words. Those are verbal actions that we should avoid. So what are m- bad mental actions that he shows? Now, the mind is connected with all these things, that's right, that's a separate thing. But there are specific mental actions that you do. Unwholesome mental states. Wishing ill ill will. Yes, anger, it's an unwholesome mental action. What else? Greed. Greed, very good. Greed is a bad thing jealousy jealousy delusion hmm? delusion hmm? so now see now these are unwholesome mental actions now when you take a precepts now my question again what kind of actions do you avoid is it mental actions or verbal or physical not mental actions so if then if you take your precepts, anger should not arise in you. Why does anger arise in you? Because you are not guarding the mind. That's a separate thing. Remember, we have to take these precepts we don't, because we don't have this developed mind in us. If our mind is already tamed, it, if it is developed, we don't have to take the precepts like that. Because naturally, your bodily actions, verbal actions will be good. But because our mind is not tamed and not developed, we have to take these precepts. It's like putting chains, right? <laughs> Sometimes it's hard, right? <laughs> Avoiding lying, is it easy? Gossiping, is it easy? Hard, right? Because our mind is not tamed. So by taking the precepts, you are only avoiding harmful verbal actions and physical actions, bodily actions. But mental actions will arise in you. Anger will be there, right? Even if you take the precepts. Right. Jealousy will be there. Mm-hmm. Greed will be there. Yes. So that separately you have to remove it. Through wise consideration. Wisely you have to think about those mental actions and remove it. So does it make sense? Mm-hmm. Right. So the second thing he says, he ha- you have to be virtuous, he says. 
वर्चुअल सी एम एन स्पेशल ही इज टॉकिंग अबाउट गुड वर्बल एक्शंस एंड मेंटल एक्शंस फिजिकल एक्शंस फर्स्ट वन यू हैव टू हैव गुड फ्रेंड्स सेकंड यू हैव टू बी वर्चुअस ट्राई टू हैव गुड वर्बल एक्शंस एंड फिजिकल एक्शंस एंड व्हेन देयर्स अ डिफाइलमेंट इन द माइंड ट्राई टू रिमेन Don't cultivate that. Right. The third one. Again, a bhikkhu gets to hear at will, without trouble or difficulty, talk concerned with the austere life that is conducive to opening up the heart. So it means that you will get to hear. talks like this what kind of talks is he says talks on fewness of desires talks on on contempt contentment solitude not getting bound up with others arousing energy about virtuous behavior about concentration about wisdom so you have to get these kinds of talks he says most of the time do we hear these kinds of things about the positives and of about uh, about about virtuous behavior the importance of virtuous behavior importance of developing wisdom importance of developing energy effort normally we don't hear those kinds of talks right Well, what kind of conversation do we have? How to hmm? get something, right? Like, hmm? how to get the new iPhone? <laughs> hmm? <laughs> That's the talk that we get. Uh, suppose we have a small, uh, old iPhone. What will what will others say? That's the new one. You have to get the new one. <laughs> <laughs> this doesn't have this feature now. Now, what happens to us? So now we. Hmm? we crave now right now there's a defilement in our mind right now it's like this now tell me now if you have money suppose there's the new iphone so you have the ability of getting it so is it wrong to get that thing what do you think okay it's the simple right now you know sensual pleasure means means looking at nice things hearing nice sounds having nice aromas nice taste and tactile sensations so we are attached to these things right sensual pleasure right now one question the same now now this now we call sensuality right it is sensuality we call it. now is it a thing that is in you or do you find sensuality outside you is it in the outside world You didn't get the question, right? Right. It's a special way, right? <laughs> 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 Why is that? Why is that? <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. Now. So now. Now the Pali word is karma. Karma means the English translation is sensuality. Means we know we are attached to these nice things that we can see, forms, nice sounds, tactile sensations, aromas, and taste. These five things. Now normally we call it this is sensual pleasure, right? Now the my question is this sensuality. This sensuality. is it something that you will, you can find outside you in the outside world or is it something that you create inside you inside what do you think mm. but but trigger from outside hmm is trigger from outside triggered from outside <laughs> the my question is not to <laughs> where triggers you my question is is it created outside or is it created by yourself sensuality yeah. well, or can you find sensuality outside the world 
this feeling, sensuality means this. I, think I don't know whether you are getting the question. The I think you'll get the craving is created by yourself. Right. Yes. Things are going to exist no matter what. Mm -hmm. It's you create them, so that creates. So why do we create those? No, that's a nice form. How? Why do we create that? Why do we? Why do we create it? How does it create in us this sensuality? Why do we create craving for those things? Yes. Uh, why does craving actually? It's not. It's like this. Actually, what he says. Uh, just see whether you can understand this. Now we say we creating it, right? Craving inside us. Actually, we are not creating it because there's a cause. Craving arises in us. Now, if you say I am creating it you will be able to remove that process. Actually now, deeply if you look at it, it's not you are, you are not creating it. Because you have a cause inside you, craving arises in you. Because there is a cause, sensuality arises in you. So what is the cause? This contact. Eh? Yes, if you deeply look at the cause, it's the delusion. Because you don't know the true nature of things. Contact is there, that's right. If you go deeply, keep in mind, it's because of delusion. Because you don't know the true nature of things. In some suttas, he says, sensuality arises because of the contact. That's right. But the con we don't know the true nature of this contact. That is because of the delusion. So the main reason is the delusion. So my question is this now. I, 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 it's, a bit deviated from the question, right? <laughs> My question is now you have you have suppose you have money and you are rich and there's a new iPhone. Is it wrong getting that new iPhone? No. Is it wrong enjoying sensual pleasures as a lay person? No. No. Hmm? No. No. Seeing nice forms, hearing nice sounds, is it wrong? So then what's the problem now? <laughs> <laughs> Thinking that that's going to bring lasting happiness. Yes. That I have to have that. Yes, think that the I problem happens is, yes, problem is, the thing is, now there's, he's, there's nothing wrong as a lay, wrong as a lay person to enjoy sensual pleasures. Thing is, people are not mindful about those sense pleasures. You have been, what's the mindfulness that these sense pleasures are impermanent? Yeah, you are getting the new iPhone. What's the new one? There's a new one, right? X something, you get the new one. <laughs> now you are not mindful about this. This is a thing that's impermanent, subject to change. Means it will break, it could break. But normally, what happens? We will take this and we look it, look at the color, right? Then we look at the glass and it is very wireless charging. The speed is like this. Now what will happen to us? We get attached to this thing. Suppose someone will accident break, accidentally break it, what will happen now? <laughs> <laughs> if you are not mindful, you will get angry, right? Mm -hmm. So there's nothing wrong enjoying sense pleasures. The thing is you have to be mindful that these things are subject to change. Why is that? That's a good question. Why is that? Like there's no end to it. Why is that? Because we're attached to the feeling that we get. He says you will never satisfy this sense pleasure. Keep you have to keep that in mind. You will be never satisfied. Once you attain that new iPhone, then you're looking for that happiness. It's like, well, okay, now it's not as bright and shiny as wanting it. Well, all right, maybe the next one. Yes, no, yeah, that's right. Now, you, suppose there's a new one. You will think, okay, this is the new one. I'm going to get this. I'll be totally happy with this. <laughs> so you will be totally happy for a few <laughs> weeks, right? <laughs> right? You will, to you will be totally happy with that for a few weeks. There's the new one, and there are advertisements, right? Saying this is like this. Now what will happen? This, this sense pleasure, you will never satisfy that. You have to keep that in mind. You will never satisfy that. Now see, have you seen people 
the very rich people, right? But they are not mentally happy. Why is that? They say that I feel this life is like em empty. Some people, when they grow old, they say like that, right? The life is empty. There's nothing in this life, and they they are truly not happy. Why is that? Because they have, they are they they have been trying to find happiness through sense pleasures. And you will never find true happiness there. You can find true happiness through developing good qualities in you. Maybe loving kindness, compassion, generosity. Then when you grow old, you can look back and be happy. I helped people. I have practiced loving kindness. So but even that feeling doesn't last. It's impermanent. That's right. That's impermanent. Yeah, that's but you will not mentally suffer with those things. Right. Mm. That's the difference. Now suppose now you will get a new, suppose now, really, now if we, we have to die someday, right? Suppose you will earn money and you will get a luxurious house. Uh, right? Now you are in the dead bed. Now you are thinking about this house. Will you be happy now to leave the house and go? No. no. But if you think, if you look back and think, okay, I help these people. I develop kindness. I was generous. What will happen? You will, f you will feel really happy, right? That's why some people, when they grow old, when they in the last moment say that if I can go back, I will change my whole life. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because they have not developed any good qualities in them. Aren't those things that come from inside you rather than outside? So the big house is something outside you, which as you say, it's like it's a house, it's there. But if you practice loving kindness and be good people, doesn't that, rather than coming from outside, isn't that coming from inside? Yes, now things, yes, now, yes, now things, people are looking for this happiness from outside objects. And see now people suffer because of those things, right? People suffer because of these sense pleasures, right? And they're fine, yeah, and they're trying to find happiness also through these sense pleasures. And that they are trying to find what you call solution for this suffering also from the sense pleasures. Will they find true happiness? For that moment, they will for, they will forget the problems that they have when they enjoy those sense pleasures. But the problem is still there. So the third thing, <laughs> you have to have these kind of toxicities, fewness of desires the importance of developing good qualities in you, important of developing wisdom in you. You have to have that kind of conversations, he says. Not the new iPhone, how to get the new iPhone. No, that's fine. But most of the time you should have. <laughs> As lay people, that's fine. You all should have those. But most of the time, you all have to have these kind of conversations. So does it make sense? Hmm? Right, so you have to have proper conversations, he says. That's the third one. Then the next one, he says, again a bhikkhu has aroused energy for abandoning unwholesome qualities and acquiring wholesome qualities. Means you have to develop energy or what you call effort in you. And he says there are four kinds of efforts that you should have when you're practicing this path. Who knows the answer? What's the first one? Effort. Hmm? Hmm? The first effort he says to prevent unwholesome states from arising in the mind. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> That's the first effort. <laughs> That's the first effort. And I hope now, at this time, we don't have anger in our minds, right? Okay. You'll have anger. Anger? No. At this no, time? No, no, This now? This time, I don't think we have anger, right? No, no, no. no. right? No. Because of the sound and all that? <laughs> Because of the sound and all that, 
Right. Now suppose now we are practicing breathing meditation. Now it's quiet. Now there's a car going by, by us with this sound. Now, now normally we will get angry, right? When we hear these sounds and all that. We have to make an effort to prevent that anger from arising in the mind. That's the first effort. Suppose you are going to work. You will see a person that you don't like. Now when you are going to work, you don't have anger. When you see that person, what will happen? I say I don't like that. You have to be mindful and mm. prevent anger from arising in the mind. Mm. Not anger, but I'll, I will, I'll even say, oh, there's that person I don't like. I don't like him because of this and this. I mean, I go on and on and on. Why is that? But that's that unwholesome. Because point. there's anger in your mind. Oh, anger. Oh, that is anger. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't have anger, we will not say like that. So you have to prevent that. That's the first effort. So by practicing maybe loving kindness, compassion, or by thinking the, uh, what do you call it, disadvantages, if when you cultivate defilements in you by thinking those things, you have to prevent defilements from arising in the mind. That's the first effort that you should have. What's the second one then? Right, you are going to work, you will see this person, you didn't have the first effort. What will happen to you? <laughs> now there's anger in the mind. So what's the second effort now? It's the effort to remove unwholesome states that have already arisen in the mind. Suppose you couldn't prevent getting anger, getting angry, or you couldn't prevent getting jealous. Now there's anger or jealousy in the mind. Second effort is to not to cultivate that, but to remove it. You should not cultivate it. You have to remove that anger. So you can remove these defilements by, first thing you have to see the disadvantages of cultivating these defilements. Now we might, now is anger, is it a good thing or a bad thing to cultivate? We know that, right? Bad thing, right? So why do we get angry still? If we know that this is a bad thing. Because we truly don't see the danger of this anger. That's all. We just know that is just what you call the knowledge that we have. The anger is a bad thing. And we say if we cultivate anger, we will suffer. That's just the, what you call the knowledge that we have. But through wisdom, we have not seen the danger of this anger. To see this, he says, you have to think about this anger. And see whether this anger will help you to have a happy life. Or will it give you suffering. And normally we know that, right? But you have to think it, mindful, just sit, or sit and just think about it, he says. Now see, now make, when you got angry in the past, see, were you happy at that time? Sometimes we couldn't sleep properly. We couldn't eat. We couldn't do things. We couldn't talk with others, right? Sometimes the first thing that came to, up, came to our mind when we woke up in the morning is this anger. And we suffered because of this anger, right? We have to think about it, not just now think and maybe in the next class you have thinking. <laughs> You have to go home and think. Tomorrow, you have to think. Day after tomorrow, think, think. Then you are sending a message to your mind, this anger is a really bad thing. There's no point cultivating this anger. So when there's, next time when there's anger, you will know that if I cultivate this, I will suffer. What's the point? You will quickly remove that anger. You will be able to remove that anger quickly. So by seeing the disadvantages of cultivating these defilements, We'll be able to remove these defilements, he says. Right. And there are other ways also. Just try to practice practice this and see first. Right. So he says the second effort is to remove unwholesome states that have already arisen in the mind. So how many efforts are there now? He says. Four efforts you have to have. 
first one is to prevent unwholesome states from arising second one is to remove unwholesome states that have already arisen in the mind what do you think is the third one I didn't hear that. Yes. Yes. Means to develop wholesome states that have not yet arisen in the mind. Suppose you you are lacking of loving kindness, compassion, letting go. You have to develop those things. And automatically those things doesn't happen. You have to think and you have to make an effort and develop those things in you. So tell me now, is it hard to develop wholesome qualities? Or is it easy to develop wholesome qualities? What do you think? Huh? Normally, the true nature, it's hard to develop wholesome qualities because we are not used to doing that. Now tell me next time if someone shouts at you, what is easy? To, pre to shout at that person and get angry or to just spread loving kindness to that person? We are <laughs> <first>. <laughs> 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 what do you think? So now, now see, the habits that we have are unwholesome habits. That's why we suffer. Habit is to get angry when, say, when someone says something that we don't like. So you have to change those habits. So he says that you have to make an effort and develop these wholesome qualities in you. What's the last effort that you should have? That's right, yes. Suppose you have loving kindness, you have to develop that. You have generosity, you have to develop that. So how do you have to maintain and perfect the wholesome qualities that you already have. So those are the four efforts that you should have, he says. Now this is the foundation. So if you have this foundation, it will be really easy to practice meditation and get good results. Have good friends. Be virtuous and have proper conversations and develop energy, means effort. And the last one is you have to develop wisdom in you. So what is the wisdom here? Not, he's not talking about the deep wisdom. Before having the deep wisdom, you have to have the wisdom knowing what is right and wrong. Some people do bad things thinking that it's right, right? Now, see now, sometimes if someone does something bad to us, we will do something in return, right? And we think that's the right thing to do, right? We have that mindset, right? Mm -hmm. He gave me this suffering, I also have to do something. Mm -hmm. And we think that's right, right? Mm -hmm. So that we have to, that is because we don't have this basic wisdom in us to understand what is right and what is wrong. So if you understand what is right and wrong, it will be really easy to understand right things and develop those good qualities in you. So he says you have to have these five things in you. This is the foundation. Then he says, that's a nice thing. Then he says, when a bhikkhu has good friends, he says, it can be expected of him that he will get to hear those proper conversations. So if there's good friends, you will have these proper conversations, he says. Then he says, when a bhikkhu has good friends, it can be expected that he will be what? Virtuous. Then he says, uh, when a bhikkhu has good friends, it can be expected of him that he will arouse energy for abandoning unwholesome qualities and to develop wholesome qualities. And when a bhikkhu has good friends, it can be expected of him that he will be wise. So what's the main thing here? Good friends. Good friends. You have to surround yourself with good friends who will help you to develop wholesome qualities in you. Then you will be able to be, you will have, you will be virtuous, you will have these proper conversations, you will be able to develop energy in you, and you will be able to develop this.
that is the foundation nice teaching right very helpful now without having this foundation suppose always you are talking about attachments to getting attached to things of developing unwholesome qualities and all those things right and you are not virtuous right and you don't have this energy you don't know right and wrong and you will go to a meditation center and you will try to meditate it's a bad thing no good but you will not get the proper results you can't get the proper results without that foundation so now slowly you have to make that foundation so any questions from this part no this is in theory right would the good friends thing basically be the importance of the sangha sorry i think it's with the good friends basically be the importance of the sangha the importance of the sangha basically the importance of the sangha is like okay i mean if you're surrounding yourself by others right that have these beliefs okay which in theory would be the sangha okay sangha right okay yeah. okay then not that would be the good friends not only sangha and there are lay people also mm -hmm. sangha and there are lay people also who have these good qualities in them sangha as well as there are lay people so not not only sangha sangha and there are lay people also who have have these good qualities you have to surround so most of the time you are not with the sangha right as lay people right mm -hmm. most of the time you are with lay people right yeah. so there are lay people also with these good qualities in them they might not have 100% good qualities but most of the time we have to surround ourselves with people who have this good qualities in them right so the it's uh, it's in uh, numerical discourses megia it's in uh, it's in actual book uh, you can have this yes in the book of the nine nine right If you want, you can have this. No, okay. Fine. So now let's talk about meditation. Now suppose we have this foundation, <laughs> right? <laughs> we have good friends, right? proper conversations. We have this energy in us, right? Wisdom, and we are virtuous. So now we have this foundation, and we learn how to do breathing meditation. Now we are talking about mindfulness of the body, breathing meditation. So the next meditation is mindfulness of the four postures mindfulness of four postures now in the sutta it says it's like this, again a monk when walking knows that he is walking when standing knows that he is standing when sitting knows that he is sitting when lying down knows that he is lying down in whatever way his body is disposed he knows that what is that is how it is now what he he says in the beginning now this meditation will really help you if you practice this it will really help you to do breathing meditation so what you have to do is just in your day day to day life take about 30 minutes of your time and try to practice this mindfulness of postures in the beginning he says try to take this four postures walking standing 
lying down and sitting sitting and lying down so it's like this now so in the beginning what you can do is you can find a place and determine a distance and think from here I'm going to walk to that place to that spot mindfully so when you are walking now normally we will lift our left foot we will keep it we will lift the right foot and we will keep it right there right but there's no need to think like that now I'm lifting my left foot now I'm keeping my left foot now I'm lifting my right foot. there's no need to label those actions like that just be mindful now I'm walking Now see from here when you are going to the car, do you, are you mindful now when I am walking? Right? Normally we are thinking, okay, I have to go home and do this. Right? You are thinking like that, right? Tomorrow I have to do this. Without thinking like that, he is saying, and from here you are going to the car. Just be mindful, I am walking. And so, suppose you are determined a spot and you are walking to that spot. Just be mindful now when I am walking. Once you go to that spot, stop. And be mindful now I'm stuck. Now I'm standing. And mindfully turn around. And you can come back to the spot where you start again. Just be mindful. I'm walking. Suppose you are talking with someone. You are sitting on a cushion and talking. Be mindful. I'm sitting on a cushion and talking. Suppose you are lying down. Just be mindful. Now I'm lying down. Now you might think these are simple things, right? Walking, I know that I am walking. Right? <laughs> sitting, I know that I am sitting. So then why can't we develop this meditation? <laughs> if you know, right? we know, right? we know that. Because we are not practicing it properly. Now even if, if we feel that these things are simple things, no. It will help you to develop this mindfulness. And I told you that when you practice this breathing meditation, there will be a point where that this experience will get so peaceful, right? And happiness will arise in you, right? In med breathing meditation, that same happiness you will be able to get if you practice this walking meditation. Your mind will get so focused on this walking, this posture, that happiness will arise in you. That happiness arose, arises in you because at that time your mind is so calm. It's so calm and there are no defilements at that time. Your mind is not running here and there. I don't think my mind is developed enough. In, in walking meditation, I get very distracted. <laughs> I'm walking, I, I, I find that I'm better in a, you know, like that person, like the mango. It's, it's like the mango. You know, I'm not developed enough to do walking meditation. So what you should have then? Pardon? So if you want to develop your mind to have a mature mind, what should you have? What should you, can I say what should you have? Right. The five things. Right. Develop those five things. And then I can do walking. You know, I just get too, you know, oh, yeah. I would fall asleep. Hmm? <laughs> 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 but, I think, but I think at some point I could. But I would have it's to possible. develop it's my mind more of the five things. Develop, first. yes, and? And meditate in a stationary position first to help develop the meditation and the other part. No, actually, it's like this. Now, those five things you should have. You have to develop those five things. And this, he says, for a person who is all, it's, I have to say, it's the, if the mind is, there's a person who, that the mind is not re calm. Suppose there's a person, there are people that, yeah. some people, they have a calm mind, right? Yeah. For some, their mind is really, it's not calm, right? right. Always it's running here and there. Mm -hmm. For a person like that, he says, don't try to do breathing meditation in the beginning. He says, don't try to practice breathing meditation, because it will be really hard. He says, try to do this walking meditation. There are two ways that you can do this walking meditation. One is, you can be mindful about the posture. Other one is, while, doing the, while walking, you can do either loving-kindness meditation, or compassionate joy or impermanent meditation. You can do some a meditation like that. So he says for a person who has this, like he's calling a monkey mind, right? <laughs> Run, running here and there. Don't try to do the breathing meditation in the beginning. 
try to do this mindfulness of postures and either do loving kindness or impermanent meditation while walking he says so in this walking meditation mindfulness of postures what you do is you will be mindful about the posture nothing else so now see now so once you improve this four postures slowly you can move into other subtle postures like suppose you are keeping the calm you are doing some you are doing the dishes now see now when we are eating normally our mind is not there right somewhere sometimes we don't know what we ate the taste we don't know because the mind was somewhere else so he says try to do this mindfulness of postures so just take 30 minutes of your time do this walking meditation be mindful about the posture and take another 30 minutes and do some, whatever you are doing be mindful suppose you are at work be mind, mindful do that thing suppose you are doing your dishes mindfully do that you are eating mindfully do that take 30 minutes in the beginning and you can gradually increase the time so that is mindfulness of postures main four postures and the other meditation clear awareness now these two meditation actually goes together mindfulness of postures and clear awareness so what he says here is furthermore when going forward or returning he makes himself fully alert when looking forward looking away then he says um when walking standing sitting sleeping talking remaining silent he makes himself fully alert so what does it mean fully alert means to do what pay attention attention to what So here, fully alert means clear awareness means he will be mindful so that he will not give arise to defilements in the mind. So he says, when walking forward, when walking, he is mindful. Now I am walking. I am going to work. Now I am walking. And the other clear awareness means he will be mindful. So if I see a person that I don't like, I will not get angry. So he will see a person. Now he is mindful. I am not going to get angry. So here, alert means alert to prevent unwholesome states from arising in the mind. Eating too much salt. Now what happens? Someone gave you something. There is too much salt in the food. Get angry. <laughs> 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 Now you are mindfully eating, right? <laughs> Clear awareness means you okay. Too much salt. I am not going to get angry. Alert to prevent that anger from arising in the mind. That's clear awareness. So whatever action you are doing, be mindful, so that defilements will not arise in your mind. now <laughs> so we have to be mindful now not to get angry when there are that one was close noises right <laughs> that is clear awareness <laughs> that is clear awareness okay, i am here sitting i am not going to get angry for those noises that is clear awareness so those two this mindfulness of postures and clear awareness goes together right any questions from these two
I don't think we'll be able to practice it here. Just you can go home and just take a determinant spot and try to do this walking meditation. Just walk mindfully. And when you're from here, when you're going to that spot, just be, be mindful and walking. When you're at that spot and when you stop, be mindful now I'm stop. Turning, be mindful, return to your spot. Take another 30 minutes, whatever you are doing, be mindful. You are sweeping the floor, mindfully sweep the floor. Now I'm sweeping. I'm not going to think about what I'm going to prepare for dinner. I'm walking, I'm sweeping. Doing the dishes, be mindful. So he says, if you practice these two, it will be really easy to sit on a cushion and do this breathing meditation. Because you are training your mind to keep in the present moment. It works just the opposite for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm good. Yes. You know, I mean, in, you know, I'm not a stranger to a lot of this. So, you know, within five seconds of being mindful that I'm sitting, my mind's gone. <laughs> but I can sit on a cushion and pretty much so be mindful, at least be mindful of when I'm not mindful of the breath. For half an hour. I can't get to an hour to save my life. 50 minutes is like my max. <laughs> but during, you know, and I mean, yeah, that's, granted I've been doing it for a while, so, so but it, that's easy. So if, you, if it is easy for you to sit on a cushion and do the breathing meditation, that's fine. You can practice that. And while doing that, try this mindfulness of postures also. For a person who is really hard to sit on a cushion and concentrate, try to do this mindfulness of postures in the beginning. And then try to do this breathing meditation. It's not like you will fully completely finish this mindfulness of postures and start breathing meditation. Both you have to do it together. But more attention may be for breathing or for mindfulness of postures. Both you have to do it together. And clear awareness. Always you have to have that. To prevent unwholesome states from arising. So do you all need a break for about 10 minutes? Okay. So then 10 minutes break.